Every morning we jump out of bed and we dive into a flood of data. Friends might have texted us, there are always more emails and tweets and Facebook updates. Some of us also have to keep track of papers, patents, grants, clinical trials data. And we need all this data to make informed decision, to swim in grace in this flood of data and to ultimately try to also stay sane. Um, however, none of us was designed to deal with this flood of data. We are optimized to make local, very daily decisions. Yet there are very important long-term decisions that we have to make in our life, such as what to study, what job to take, whom to marry, and how to devote our resources and time and passion. Fortunately, there are now tools that help us make sense of massive amounts of data, that help us render this data into maps, into visualizations that not only experts, but also general audiences can understand. And colleagues of mine and I, we have been creating and curating the Places and Spaces Mapping Science exhibit over the last years. And this effort is a 10-year effort to bring these maps, these new maps of our collective knowledge to a general audience. We are now in the eighth year and we have altogether 80 maps, which you see in very small thumbnail images behind me. The real maps are 24 by 30 inch large, 300 dpi. Many of them, by the way, are online, so you can explore them online. And many of them have interactive counterparts. And these maps have been created by more than 200 map makers around the globe. Each year, the exhibit, go one back, the exhibit has a theme. The uh, very first iteration of the exhibit uh, is on the power of maps, if we can go one back. The second iteration is on the power of uh, reference systems. The third iteration is on the power of forecasts. Can we actually forecast science? And so um, in the first iteration, you get to compare and contrast first maps of our planet to the very first maps of science. And as you know, the very first maps of our planet were not perfectly accurate. And still, they help people find prosperous lands to avoid monsters like the Krampus and to <laughs> find their way home. Uh, maps by Moll, like the one you should see now, have been designed uh, not even 300 years ago. And they show California still as an island and the outer coastline of Australia is not fully known and it's only partially drawn. And I just wish that today's map makers would be as honest and simply lay out the data which is too uncertain or which they don't have or draw a big cloud on top of it. <laughs> Some of the maps in the exhibit are very personal. This is a map by a PhD student who couldn't explain to his advisor what his PhD thesis is about. And he tried for quite a while and at the end gave up, went to the next big city just to have a good time and envision the next project. But in that city he saw a subway map and he realized that he can represent all the many trains of thought complete with knowledge transfer and train exchange points as a subway map. And his advisor happens to be a big fan of subway maps and the maker of this map is now Dr. Keith Nesbitt. Other maps use advanced data mining and visualization techniques to render an entire science by visual means. Here you have a map created from abstracts submitted to the annual meeting of the American Association for the Geography. So you have 22,000 abstracts and he trained a neural network model to render these um, abstract using its self-organizing map. And after much training, each of these abstracts that share a lot of words in common are closer together and they constitute these mountains which you see here. And each mountain is labeled by the most frequently occurring keyword and it's rendered ultimately using a GIS system. So you see 
the mountains, and these are the areas which um, geographers study, such as population studies, migration studies, community studies. Geographers also study women. And there is this green valley to the left of you, which um, is puzzling because those are abstracts which are very dissimilar to each other. And it's not really clear if this is the valley of the lost and confused authors and their abstracts, or if this is an area where the sediments of the surrounding mountains come down and create a very fertile, fruitful research environment for um, potentially very interdisciplinary and very um, path-breaking research. Other maps in the exhibit um, show us how connected we all are. This work by Kolitsa and Vespignani tries to, tries to predict and ultimately prevent the next pandemic influenza. As you might know, diseases in former times, they used to travel in waves, about 200 to 400 miles a year. Here you see an example of Black Death in the 14th, 14th century. In today's time and age, our diseases and us travel very conveniently via the airline transportation system. And they travel to urban centers and from there out to more rural areas. So the models which um, Kolitsa and Vespignani develop, they take into account not only when and where an outbreak occurs, but also how infectious this disease is. And you can then use these models to try to predict the result of different intervention strategies. So for instance, should the US use all of the vaccines just in the US, or should it share them globally? And it turns out that if they are shared globally, there are actually going to be less fatalities in the US. By the way, similar models have now been applied also to study the diffusion of ideas and of innovations. In the exhibit, you also have a map um, by Bart Shelley on the history of science fiction. And I hope you get to check it out and like to zoom into these areas. You might see your favorite sci-fi Roman, or you might be seeing new topics to explore. Also part of the exhibit is a map of all the video lectures of the Khan Academy. And you get to see the topical space of all these free lectures that are now available for, to anyone. But you also get to see how long they are and how often they have been downloaded. And I truly hope that the call for maps for next year's iteration of the exhibit shows and attracts a map that shows us the space of all these massively open online courses, the MOOCs, so that we all get a better understanding of what kind of combination of courses might get us the next degree or the expertise we always wanted to have. The exhibit features 73 other maps and also interactive elements, some of which you see here. The, the exhibit has been on display in 194 venues so far. These are libraries, these are science museums, these are national academies. It's currently on display at the National Academy of Science in DC. And we have 44 exhibit advisors around the globe, which any one of you can contact to bring the exhibit to a place near you. Many of the maps you just saw have been designed using advanced data mining and visualization techniques. And my team and I, we have been working very hard to create open data, open code, and open courses so that any one of you can create your own maps. And so I believe that anyone can cook and any one of you also can map, or both can definitely be learned easily. Try it, it's actually fun. So we have been created what we call macroscopes. I assume you are familiar with microscopes and telescopes that help you to see things that are too small or too far away to be seen with your naked eyes. Macroscopes, inspired by Rosnay's futuristic science writings, they help you to see structure and patterns and trends in large amounts of data. While microscopes and telescopes are typically static instruments, these macroscopes are continuously evolving bundles of software plugins. 
So you can actually take an empty plate or an empty shell and you put your favorite data readers in, those that read your email or your spreadsheets. And then you go over to the next tray and you get your favorite data cleaning, data mining algorithms. And you go over to the next tray and you get your favorite visualization tools and design tools. And then you bundle it all up, you give it your own name, Kati Stream Tool, for instance, and you're ready to go to analyze your own data. And we benefit deeply here from OSGI, the Open Service Gateway Initiative um, software standard. More than 100,000 students, researchers, and practitioners have been downloading the, these uh, tools, and they are using them to answer when, where, what, and with whom questions using temporal, geospatial, topical, and network analysis algorithms. The Information Visualization MOOC at Indiana University makes it even easier for you to embrace and try out these new tools. We have students from 93 countries registered. Among them are 300 faculty members, so it's not just me teaching, actually. It's a lot of other um, faculty members pitching in, and if you want to just see what we are doing, use CIV MOOC tag to check out on Flickr and Twitter a real-life data feed of the best visualizations, the best tools, the best um, jobs. There are many jobs that actually need this kind of skill, and also the best company doing research and um, development in that area. So. Uh, Go have fun with maps and macroscopes, then come back and share data, share your code, share your insights, because we all need this insight to make better local and global, but also better short-term and long-term decisions. Thank you.